Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and everyone on the World Wide Web. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. Winky Wright and KTFO Boxing is proud to present Go Talk. Go no, my man, Winky. The greatest of all time. I'm not kidding. Okay, okay. So without okay, further ado, okay. let's go. Welcome to KTFO. You got knocked the fuck out. Okay, boxing. Go <laughs> talk. You already know what it is. We got the junior middleweight, undisputed champion of the world, and also 2018 International Boxing Hall of Fame, and also one of my partners in uh, pro-am golfer, Winky Wright, in the building. What's up? And also, light middleweight champion, and also welterweight champion, and our guest today for Go Talk, Mr. Keith Thurman. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me on the show, fellas. We appreciate you so much. So we're in beautiful St. Pete. Wink just got off the golf course. Uh, I watched him get a triple on the... Um... Oh, now we're going to talk about this. Why not? Why my not? Game, my game bad right now. Keith seen my game bad lately. You know, he he trying to get him a win. I put money on myself right now. Yeah. I'll tell you that. Yeah, but, but, <laughs> but before he wouldn't. Right. <laughs> you just started golfing. How long have you been golfing, Keith? Uh, it's been three, maybe four years. You know, I've had some um, surgeries and stuff. Yeah. So, you know, but I like to just hit the par three course over here, Trail Bro Brooks here in uh, St. Pete, yeah. Twin Brooks. Twin, Twin Brooks, Brooks over here. Shout out to like, Twin Brooks. Shout out, you know, I just like to get over there sometimes after the gym because it don't take up all my time. I get to just hit the ball a little bit and then get right back to wifey and the newborn yeah. baby. Yeah, he got a newborn, you know what I mean? Yeah. So he won't be playing too much golf Can't right do now. all 18, boy. <laughs> that's it. That's an event. That's the one thing about golf, boy. He got you out there all day. All day. So, Keith, first of all, again, I thank you for your time. This is called Goat Talk, where the greatest of all times talk about the greatest sport of all time. One of them, right? Boxing, baby. The greatest of all time. Greatest sport of all time. That's the right. hardest sport ever. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's just so taxing on the body. You know, offense, defense, three-minute intervals. I mean, what we do, there's so much talent in every sport. There's something to admire in every sport. But I believe that no sport can ever outperform the action that we bring into the ring when it comes to boxing. Yeah, that's even UFC. UFC got some tough – them them guys in some great shape. But to, to literally stand in and box, right. you know, throw punches, can't hold, can't lay on the ground, can't – you know, you hold, the referee going to break you. You got to work. You that's got right. three minutes to work. That's and right. we're going for 12 rounds. So it's a very disciplined sport and it's a very tough sport. But, you know, you got to be a king to want to do it. So Wink, we already know you one of the best defensive fighters of all time. No one no hard to hit. I'm hard to hit, ain't I? But <laughs> definitely hard to knock down Keith Thurman one time, right? One time, so, baby. How'd you get the name one time real quick, just so people will know? Oh man, it is a it's a funny story. So my name is Keith Thurman Jr. A lot of people don't know that I am a junior because we don't really um put it in the ring name. Right. But people who know me uh, know that I'm named after my father and the name one time is actually another name I stole from my father <laughs> so my father out there in Painesville Ohio you know shout out Menor in Painesville um, out there he did a little bit of backyard brawling kind of like that Kimbo slice you know before YouTube before anything they just did it for the streets they just did it for the bragging rights you know and he apparently used to have this little body shot he hit them boys with. And if he hit them one time, right. that was all it took. <laughs> right. You know? Right. And, and he told me that story. <laughs> and I was about 19 years old. I just turned pro at 19. And he told me that story. And I thought it was a real cool story. You know, I, I don't know. I think it took Wink a little while before, uh, you know, he really did his ring name too. And we even saw him winking in the camera from time to time. Right. And apparently his family always called him Winky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Grandmama so, started that, yeah, right? Grandma started. Yeah. You know, so our, our ring names, a lot of times they go they go way back and there is some history yeah. to it. So for me, I did not want to have a ring name off bat in my professional career. Right. You know, um, I started here in locally in the Tampa Bay area with eight consecutive first round KOs and TKOs. Right. And after that year of work, I said, look, boy, you knocked everybody out in the first round. You can call yourself whatever you want and they're right. going to gonna accept it. Right. And then that's when I said, well, they ain't even got out of the first round. I might as well be Keith one time Thurman. And I took that name from my father. I carried it, uh, you know, further than he ever yeah, imagined. You know what I mean? It. It's, it's going to be a Hall of Fame kind of name. Yeah. Uh, but at the end of the day, one time is a is another name I took from my father. But it meant more than me than, than carrying on 
his name once again. One time is what the fans came to see. I don't care if you're a Keith Thurman fan, a Winky Wright fan, or this and that. Honestly, if somebody gets hit one time and knocked the fuck out, <laughs> you're going to go home satisfied. And that's you know what, what we like. Mean? TKFO, baby. Knock the fuck K-T-F-O. out. K-T-F-O. 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 You know, <laughs> it'll roll off your tongue if it comes along. I'm that's, sorry, Keith. That's what it's all about for the for the fans, especially the casual fans, but all right. fans. That's why, you know, they say don't blink. You know, uh, you, back in the day, a Mike Tyson fight, you want to go get some popcorn. The fight's over already, right, right. you know. So I just love that one time is I just think it was one of the greatest boxing names that I can come up with for the boxing fans. And then it also is a double edged sword. One time is what I'm trying to do to you. But mm-hmm. one time is what can be done to me. Right. So when I represent Keith one time Thurman, <clears throat> every single time I step in the ring, mm-hmm. I know that it's a double edged sword and that it's the realest of the real. And it's a name you got to live up to. You know what I mean? It's a it's tough to to live up to that name one time because you know you can get in there and, and be fighting and people are like, man, I want to see him one time. I want to see the one time punch. So you know that's a lot of pressure you put on yourself, but you stood yeah. up to it. You get what I'm saying? You you go out, you get the people what they want to see, and and they loving it. You know they can't wait to see you again. So you need to let the fans know when you think about getting back in the ring. Uh, we're working right now to uh, solidify January. You know, um, I was trying to get, Uh-oh. I was trying to get off into um, into this season. I was trying to get back into the ring, but it wasn't fully announced. I didn't make a big deal about it. But after the Pacquiao fight, I came down with COVID, so I went out to Vegas. I worked the Pacquiao fight. It was great. I was already getting in shape a little bit. I was highly motivated. I thought I might get a November date, maybe a December date, and then I was sick for uh, two weeks. And then it's really kind of you don't feel good for about three weeks, really. Um, you're back. You're, you're, I was back after two weeks, mm-hmm. but I'm trying to get in the gym. Mm-hmm. And in the gym, I still felt some taxation on my body, and I just had to recover from that. Now we're moving and we're grooving. I feel great. My lungs feel great. And um, we just had to kick it back to January. It's all good uh, for the body. Um, 2020 was a BS year. We'll get to that. 2021 yeah. is a BS year. Yeah. But 20, uh, you know, this up and coming year, two, 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 baby. You know, we got to do something. Right. You know. <laughs> right. Two, two, two. And, and just right. The, you already read off two, 2001 already. You just like just train and just write it off and just go into the next year. Then right. In the next year, and and the most important thing, and Wink knows this too, man. Not only do we come from the same gym, but you know. Similarly, we've had longer layoffs than we wanted yeah, right. for our careers at certain point of our that's careers. Ducking. You know, we'll t- we'll talk about the ducking in a minute. <laughs> and and right now, all that matters for me is get back. You know, take a get back fight, yeah, get right. back, and once when we get back, keep the ball rolling. Let's work this momentum. Let's redon them. My dominate. whole goal is to re-dominate the whole welterweight division. I'm beltless. I'm strapless. So that means I'm gunning after everyone. And I have to take all the opportunities that get thrown my way. Yep. There's, there's a great fight with Terrence Crawford and Sean Porter. Uh-oh. Terrence has been very adamant about fighting me. He wanted Bob Arum to try to get me this year. Bob Arum tried to say that he'll pay me what they paid me six years ago. I said, Bob, you tripping. You know? I said, put that's, some respect that's, that's on another, my name. That's another thing on boxing. We're going to slow down because yeah. we want to get into all of that. Jump yeah, you flowing, you flowing. <laughs> Interview gonna be five minutes. Nah, man, we, no, we no, no, we're gonna slow it down. We're gonna slow it down. Saying, we're gonna slow it down. Saying, no, no, we boy, got you. We're gonna put you. We already know. We, I we, got plans that's for right. next yeah. year. That once when we get back, we can get back on that world champion status. Yes, I think sir. there are great fights in the welterweight division. Is. Definitely, it's the COVID done slow down a lot, but I think next year it's really gonna pick up. And I think all the fighters like me who are still in their prime young enough mm-hmm. i think it's about time there there's no more time to wait we've covid gave us so much time to wait on there's no more time to wait these champions need to fight the other champions and i believe in the welterweight division i can't speak yeah. for other divisions but right, the welterweight yeah. division i think it's going down next year we're just going to have a lot of great fights okay all right cool so what got you into boxing like because wink and i were talking you know wink grew up in dc Hood, mm. sort of. Was it hood? No, uh, no. I, I I was born in the in the projects, but no, nah, I grew up in a nice neighborhood. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> no, nah, I'm right. gonna be 100. I grew up in it. a nice. Yeah, I grew up in a nice neighborhood, and uh, you know, we just 
you know, my neighborhood, we always like to compete in everything from basketball, football, baseball. And then I always wanted to box. You know, Sugar Ray Lennon was a D.C. guy, you know. Uh, so I always grew up watching Sugar Ray Lennon. We learned how to body punch and stuff like that. So right. that would taught me how to fight inside a lot and not being scared to get hit inside. And then, you know, when I moved to Florida, I just always wanted to box. But I never had time. Like I said, I was playing football, basketball, baseball continuously growing up every year every year you're gonna play all three in a row all three in a row all three in a row so boxing had no time but then when i moved to florida i i wasn't doing all three of them like that i went out for basketball from my high school but i was living in the wrong school zone and so i couldn't play basketball and then the guy told me about a boxing club and i was like you know what i always want to do is let me check it out and it wasn't it was like five minutes from my house man you can't hoop yeah so i went like that and then next thing you know the rest is history yeah Good, good choice. Because if you've been trying to be hooping, yeah, wouldn't, I wouldn't be here. Guard. It wouldn't be. It, <laughs> so it wouldn't be go talk. Yeah, right. That'd be another talk. <laughs> Tough talk. Keith, uh, who's a mentor to you that, um, like when you know, because boxing is, is is so much physical, but it's mental, correct? It, it's mm -hmm. so much strategy and it's so much thought process. And I know the mental part. You have to be at a hundred percent. So if you're down and you need outside of your wife, like. If you need to be mentally picked up, who do you turn to for mental guidance and, and as a mentor? Well, really, man, um, I already do a lot of um, self-reflecting. Nice. And it's, it's hard to do, but you got to be honest with yourself, True. you know, and you got to do your best to not bullshit yourself. Right. And that's where honesty comes in. The more honest you can be, the less bullshit you'll let yourself believe. Because the thing about our minds is we can convince ourselves anything you know we i call it self rational rationalization so do you believe in manifestation i believe in manestation definitely i mean okay. you know to come from where we come from and make right. our dreams yeah, come true it. you gotta, gotta believe really, in that yeah. manifestation really. can we talk about that real quick and then we'll go back to the mentor but oh, like, yeah, i'll tell you so a nice how, little story please so, so before i was ever on tv um i still was making like a thousand or fifteen hundred a fight, you know, Ooh, and them days. Uh, I remember them days. <laughs> and I had a hand injury. I had a hand injury before all the major injuries and surgeries, and I wasn't sure what to do about it. And I had to sit out for eight months. I was getting acupuncture. Nobody advised surgery, but I really had to take some kind of approach. And I was getting acupuncture, and I was sitting there. Uh, at that time, I was reading um, a lot of buddhist books different world religions and the power of manifestation all at the same time i was nice. probably about 22 going on 23 years old at this time did somebody put you up on that or did you just find it and it just i, I was always sought for it i was always into um philosophy because at, at that age right there i should have been in college right but gotcha. i but i dropped out of high school to pursue boxing because when i dropped out of high school i was able to be at the gym with winky right and jeff left hook lacy and i tell people <laughs> i left one education and get another right 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 and that was the education of champions and that's how i'm a champion today yes sir right and i said i can always go back and pick up a book but i can only live my dream once yes, so sir. i was we were very determined at a very young age and wink saw it too yeah, in the gym so. and a lot of people questioned my motives because i was so young and you don't know this is one of those sports you don't know so everyone kept saying man this kid looks like he's got it but does he really got it mm -hmm. and and i and i get that but we had to put our foot down we had to go all the way full throttle but even though we did what we did in the amateurs and we turned over into the pros and it was a slow start it even got slower when i was having this hand problem and i wasn't making much mm -hmm. money was it so the left or the right it was the left hand yeah because you got one of the the best right they say you got the best right hand in <laughs> boxing like for real like you got the best right hand in boxing I like, well, it's one time for a reason, you know. It's yeah. the right hand, it's the left hand, it's, it's one a body of, shot. It's one it's just, give me one, just let me land one good one. One, one, one good one. Yeah. You know? I, I digress, but keep going. I'm sorry. So it was hard not making any money. I was riding my bicycle three miles to Indian Rocks Beach to go get acupuncture to heal my hand. Right. Twice a week, every week, right? Did it work? Oh, it worked. It took about um, took about two months. OK. Gotcha. And then it and then it really started coming back around. I told Al Heyman, you know, my hands back. I'm ready for a fight. We got back. I knocked a kid out in the first round with a body shot. They all looked at me and said, yeah, Thurman's back. I got another fight. Luckily, it was uh, on the undercard at the MGM Grand. It wasn't really televised, but luckily for me, it was on the pay-per-view channel. 
Like mm -hmm. it was it was yeah, free before the fight, before yeah. the fight, before the and fight. they showed it, yeah. and then you can buy the fight because there was action packed championship boxing later on that night. But I was on that little slight televised little event which got me my first ever ten thousand mm dollars -hmm. so we went from three thousand to ten thousand and then luckily for me somehow that white boy got paid twelve thousand and then i said Psst, you got to pay my boy twelve so i actually went from ten to twelve mm -hmm. when my last fight i just made three mm -hmm. right so we just came back. Now you want to talk about the power of manifestation. Yes, sir. I was out for eight months. Okay. Mm. I was reading Buddhist books. I was reading about the power of a manifestation. And I'll tell you what I told myself. I said, you are a shining star. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows mm -hmm. because you're dormant. Mm -hmm. But the moment that you start, the moment you spark and you ignite, you're going to shine so bright for the world to see. And I believe that. I believe that I have the power to shine brightly, even though I was living at my mother's house. Mm. I was living at my mother's house. 22, in Clearwater, 23 year old. 22, 23 years old, living at my mother's house. Just same hood that I grew up with, one block away from my elementary school where I met Ben Getty, who got me into boxing, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. I haven't left my neighborhood yet. Right. But I believe that we were a shining star waiting for that moment. So after that $12,000 fight, I get a phone call. You're going to have your first fight on HBO. Who do they want me to fight? Marcos Maidana. Mm -hmm. Whether it was lucky for me or not lucky for me, Maidana pulled out of the fight three weeks before the fight. But they still needed me to cover the HBO card. Mm -hmm. So Al said, look, they, they were going to pay you this. You can't fight Maidana. They want to pay you that. But I promised you this, so I'm going to get you this, right? Mm -hmm. I went from $12,000 to $125,000. You know, still living at my mama's house. And that's mm -hmm. a big jump, especially and I, when you, <laughs> yeah. that's a big jump. And I, that's a big jump. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a, I, felt, yeah. I felt so grateful because yeah. Wink knows the yeah. struggle. I never fought for 20 grand. I never yeah. fought for 60 grand. Yeah. I never fought for 80 grand. You jumped there, from there's, three there's to 12, yeah. right. Yeah, three to 12 to 125,000. Nice. And, and, and so, so I do believe in the power of manifestation. Another thing is uh, the power of manifestation some people do believe you can just sit, meditate, and make things come to you. I still believe that you have to plant the seeds ahead of time, water them, nurture them, and constantly believe that the fruit from the tree will manifest. And then there's no telling. You know, there, there are some trees, there are some flowers out there that they take years to grow. Weird, exotic flowers that only bloom under a full moon and mm -hmm. weird, exotic. They only come every so many years. Um, what was that? Dennis the Menace. Remember in that old Dennis the Menace movie? Wow. They had that showing of some flower and the kid stomped on it. Yeah, he yeah, so weird. Right, <laughs> weird thing. Yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah. It's, 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 it's a cactus right now. Me and my girl, it's a cactus around by where I live at. It, it only bloom at nighttime. That's crazy. Really? It's a, it's a cactus only bloom at night. You know what I'm saying? It's, for some reason, these flowers only open up at nighttime. Every time I'm going home, I'm looking at me and my girl was like, damn, look at these flowers. They only they only show at night. And then they fall house, off. By yeah, your house? Yeah, then they fall off in about a week. You've been, you know you been, you been taking some trap house treats because nah, they hit different. Nah, like for you real. Are you crazy? I don't, I I'm, you I'm drug, drug no free. Smoke, drug free, man. Wait, drug free. Right. Yeah, it's crazy. I'm dead serious. All right, I'm dead cool. serious. Listen, you don't know what's gonna how it's going to manifest, but if you believe you planted your seeds you know what i'm saying if don't matter who believes in you who doesn't believe in oh, you you believe, you in. believe in, right. in yourself right. right you believe in yourself of course it's great to have that surrounding people that mm -hmm. people uplift you right but if people are uplifting you and people are telling you that you got it and you don't believe in yourself that self-belief is i believe the true power that manifests all That's things right. so you grew up wink Big brother, mm -hmm. yeah. what what was your best Winky White right fight that you watched that you can remember right off the top? <laughs> oh, I mean the whole the whole series yeah. from um, Shane Mosley one and two and 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 Tito that that right mm. there at the prime of Wink's career. Um, I was fortunate enough to start working with Wink before the Mosley fight. And I mean, one of my favorite moments was the first time I ever got in the ring with Winky. Mm. You know, I was <laughs> what about, happened. He was a young kid. I, I was man. 16 years old. Punishing you know, everybody. 
I was yeah, I was already <laughs> I was, was already hurting a Hurt. lot of people. Yeah. Actually, I think I think I got in with you before I was 16 because we started at St. Pete Boxing at yeah. 15, and I remember working with Eccles at 15 too. Yeah. So I was probably even you know, I was probably 15 years old the first Fighting time I got grown, in the man. ring. Yeah, what was wrong from, with you, man? Shorty I was, was going for knockout. He was, was going for knockout. He I was, was all hungry. hungry. Is that considered the hunger? Is that yeah, that? Shorty, it, it just Ben Getty. It was what Ben Getty had him. Listen, he was a get little him, kid. Look, <laughs> can you imagine a light skinned kid get him, get him, with long hair? Right. Right. So you know, people always looking at him. Oh man, he he red. He got long hair, like you know, straight hair. Oh, he ain't tough. Genuine shorty looking, shorty right? get in that ring and was punishing Ooh. big dudes. I was laughing. I was like, <laughs> it was so funny, right? Dan told me, you got to come see this kid, man. You got to see this kid. Da, da, da. So then I started watching. I said, oh, man, kid, strong. And, you know, because he would go for knockout. You know, it wasn't, it was like, I ain't, we ain't boxing. When you in the boxing gym training, you training to learn. You training to work with people. Did him, you training to not get knocked out because Shorty coming dodge. to knock you out. He right. coming. He, so him and Jeff was like that. I was like, oh, oh yeah. he's, this going to be. I got so many knockouts in the gym. Yeah. It was ridiculous. This going to be some crazy stuff. Well, go ahead and finish your story. <laughs> no, wait, wait, wait. Because I want to, now, did you ever catch him? Well, that was very, I, I'll oh. tell you the story, man. I ain't doing <laughs> Ooh, I ain't doing this. Well, this is I'm what tell I came story. to see. So, Cause wait, hold on, hold on. <laughs> wait, because you don't, you know, boxing, competitive, so much trash talking. You know, like, yeah. I love my golf. dog. But I, I trash talk golf. Oh, I always trash talk golf. you want to quit. Yeah, 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 go. So yeah, I do. I want to hear, like, now. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. All right. All right. I just want to hear this. So. I was about 15 years old, and we go to St. Pete Boxing Club. And I think this was a little bit right before we really joined, joined their, yeah. their club. Yeah. And Ben told me, he goes, today, you're sparring Winky. And I remember when my 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 big brother, before these boys were my big brother, Chris Rangel used to go over there and get work with them because okay. he was older than me. Okay. And he used to get work with them. And I remember watching it a little bit. But Ben told me, I'm on the outside of the ring. Winky's already in the ring getting work with his with a sparring partner already putting in four rounds, whatever, four, six rounds, whatever he's doing, like champions do. And he's about to work with me on the back end, an amateur. So Ben said, watch his jab. It's a world-class jab. I'm outside of the ring. I see him throw the jab. It goes from the chin out back to the chin. <laughs> I say, shit's a jab. What's so special about it? Right. Right. So it's my turn, you know, and I, I knew Winky wasn't a puncher. I'm a puncher, you know. So I have this little young man, testosterone, confidence coming up in me. Like, I got to show this pro. I got to <laughs> show him what I can do, right. you know. And they put the headgear on me. I get in that ring. And Bell goes, ding. A few seconds. What Dan says, no less than five seconds. It probably was right about that five-second mark. Boom, I get hit with my first jab. <laughs> I said, I said, okay, hold up. I said, okay, hold up. Discombobulated gas. Here goes another one. Boom, here goes another one. I said, hold up. That, what the, that was stupid. Hold up. Okay, no, no, no. I got this. I got this. Then he hit me for the first time ever, and probably the last, a triple jab. Bop, Ooh. bop, bop. All three hit. Right. Right? Square. Square. He hit me on my nose that day. I went back to school with with with, with two lines, and people, <laughs> they said, how you get that? I said, sparring with Winky. They said, they said how'd it go? I said, like Tony the Tiger, baby, it was great. You know <laughs> right. what I'm saying? But Winky... Winky hit me with a triple jab, and then I was frustrated. I said, this is stupid. I The doctor told me I have 20-20 vision. I'm 15 years old. I should be able to see this shit, and I couldn't. I promised myself. I had gloves on, right. but I said, I'm going to pry my eyes open, <laughs> right. and I, I swear on God, I'm going to see this next punch. Right. So I saw it. By the time I saw it, it was this close to my face. Right. I went to go move, and I still got hit. And that was the day I learned what a world-class jab truly was. Wingy was on that whole nother level. And then the defense, you know, I'm, right. you know, okay, you're hitting me with jabs. Yeah. Bop, 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 your top. I'm looking like a bobblehead, similar to Tito <laughs> Trinidad in the fight, right. you know. Right. And, and I said, it doesn't matter. I'm strong. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna get him. And I hit him. And I hit his arms. And I hit him. And then I want to hit his uppercut. And he's just blocking everything. And it's like, what do we do? <laughs> I don't know what to do. I did my best, and there's nothing there. You know, I mean, and that's that, and this is before the peekaboo. Everything he just straight just tuned. How old was Wink about then? I don't know. How old are you now? Uh, 32. He was 16 he's 32. I'm he saying he's 32 now, so I'm eight, I'm 18. I'll be 18 years old now. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. I'll yeah, be 50 so, this year. Saying. I think I'll he was about 32 when because yeah, it was yeah. right. He it was right in his prime, you. right when yeah, he was yeah. just started. Yeah. To, yeah. Right before he took over the whole division. Yeah. yeah. And it, and it was a beautiful thing because you know he was doing good in his career, 
But somebody told Mosley, don't fight Winky right. And he had the balls to say, no, I'm the real champion. Don't tell me who not to fight. I'm going to prove to you that Mm -hmm. Winky is nothing, that I can handle him. And obviously, they fought twice. Right. You know, I take my hat off to Mosley all the time. I tell people without Mosley, I might have never got the chance to blow up. Because no one would give me that chance. You know what I'm saying? It was all about, well, he fought this person. He fought that person. He ain't do this. He ain't do that. But, you know what I'm saying? Like I say, you need that other opponent to make you great. You need that person to bring out the best in you. And that's what Shane did. I had a title. Shane had two titles. It just beat Oscar twice. So everybody thought Shane was going to dominate. And, you know, it was like, you know, okay, now this is my time to step up. You know, what what what, what uh, Eminem said, everybody get a chance to blow. This is your right. time to blow. That's your time. You got to step up. And that's what I did. And uh, like I said, by by me doing that and, and realizing the boxing game was just so crazy, it was just like, you know, I just want to fight now, beat the best, and then I'm done. And then uh, got to see Keith come up, Jeff Lacey come up. It was some Tarver come up. You know what I'm saying? And it was great that we had all these great champions in the same area. You know, from from me and Jeff and Tarver, you know, and then when then you got Keith coming up, knocking everybody out. And I'm telling people, you know, I'm t- before he even got, I was telling people, because everybody was on me, I was like, nah, y'all, I got a, a kid in my gym. He going to be a champion, and he going to destroy people. Yeah, I, I, show, I showed him a picture of him. Oh man, he don't look like he can fight. I said, don't worry about what he look like. <laughs> Watch when he hits him, one of y'all. And everybody's like, man, we can't see. Me and Dan kept telling people, kept telling people. Then when they finally seen him on TV, they called me. That's that kid you told. I said, I told you, done. Electric fine. So, and that kid went on the first 24 fights. Nobody can go the distance with him. Knocking him out. I think only two did, right? Just dropping everybody. Like, What's your favorite Keith Thurman fight? Now you you know you watch him now, as a kid. Now Go my ahead. listen, my favorite Keith Thurman. Listen, our, everybody already knew he could punch. Everybody knew he he was quick, but people didn't know how tough he was. So I always I told him when he fought the kid, uh, Galazzo, Galazzo, Galazzo or whatever, and Keith got hurt with the body shot. Right. That was the most impressive fight to me because Shorty didn't go down. A lot of people, when when you got fighters where Keith was at that's undefeated, you know, they get a lot of fights where they they supposed to win. They don't have any challenges. Keith had a challenge right then. Keith was on TV. Keith got hurt with a body shot, but Keith kept going. Keith moved around. He showed how smart his, well, his boxing generalship was. He moved around. He, he didn't let the kid hold him. He grabbed a little bit. He did what he had to do, get out the round. Next round, he moved around again, but then he went right back to fighting tough and hard. And I told Dan right after that fight, I said, that right there, that was the most impressive fight to me to any of them. Now, I still like the Pacquiao fight. He got in his biggest fight, biggest first pay-per-view fight, he got dropped the first round just from pulling back. Pulled mm-hmm. back, got dropped. Okay, I got caught. Shorty came back and fought that fight, man, gave Pacquiao everything he won. Do you know, the same. It only, yeah. And the only reason, like I said, they gave Pacquiao the, the fight to me because he's Pacquiao. Everything Pacquiao do, you gonna, he going to get – Points for it. Keep got to do extra hard just to get the same points Pacquiao going to get. Mm-hmm. Just because Pacquiao is known Pacquiao fame. But if you go watch that fight without the people talking in the background, you'll see a whole different fight. Now, you after the <clears throat> tough decision with Danny Garcia, you had to get surgery, right? Like, And then you had a two-year layoff period. Like, What was that like going through? The, like, you can't, it's it for physically, you can't hurt yourself. You can't destroy the brand at all but you have to sit back and fall back for two years like it was that tough so at that point the real problem was i ended up having a um elbow surgery with bone spurs and i fought the week of the fight i had to get a cortisone shot in my elbow just so that the inflate inflammation would be low enough so that i can get through the fight we got through the fight we won the fight we had a good strategy for that fight but what bothered us the most was it only took so long for the elbow to heal Mm -hmm. afterwards i was in japan and i was going around to different boxing clubs i was spending time with my wife uh, because she was living in tokyo at the time and i went to a boxing gym and i just hit the heavy bag for fun and then i hit the heavy bag and i hurt my hand shit was you know some heavy Mm. bags are Mm. a little like a little too hard like cement Mm. like like, wet wet cement like at the end of the day I hurt my hand. I didn't think nothing of it. I thought, um, two weeks, you know, maybe I just sprained it, whatever. And I push it to the side. We get back to the States. I start training. I want to get into a fight. I start my camp up and I say, you know what? My hand is really 
bothering me. This little problem hasn't gone away yet. I said, what's the deal? I go and get an MRI. And then that's when they start telling me about my hand problem. And then I say to myself, well, I've had little issues before. Maybe it's just inflammation. Everything should be able to go away. The problem is it didn't go away. By the time that I knew that I was advised to have hand surgery, I looked at the doc and I said, I advised myself to go make some money. So, <laughs> you know, that's when I got back in the ring with a 22-month layoff and I fought um, Jose Cito Lopez. Oh, yeah, that was and, then, and, then, and then doc looked at me again and said, you ready to have this hand surgery? And I said, doc. They about to give me Pacquiao and you want to cut up in my hand and tell me everything's going to be all right. Mm. So I think we'll put you on hold once again, you know? And so I just, I just kept pushing myself in my career, man, uh, which happens with, with multiple athletes yeah, and multiple definitely. different sports. What was really challenging for me is if I would have, if I would have understood my diagnosis when it happened in Tokyo, I would have had enough time to get the surgery then and recover. But after the Danny Garcia fight, what was really frustrating is I was the undisputed welterweight champion of the world, ranked number one. Mayweather just retired. Mm -hmm. So I'm legitimately the only undefeated unified champion. Mm -hmm. It made me the legitimate number one welterweight in the world, and I was inactive. And then after I knew I couldn't get back into the ring, I called up Al. I knew mm. I couldn't get back in the ring. That's when I chose to relinquish one of my belts mm. so that both sanctioning bodies wouldn't jump on me. Mm. I gave up one belt, allowing action to compete in the welterweight division, but I held on to the WBA super, and I didn't lose that until the fight uh, against Pacquiao. Pacquiao in the summer of 19. But <clears throat> it's it's just been up and down rodeo. Um, you know, obviously there's things I could have done to took uh, better care of my health. I could have got maybe better uh, professional advice, but I was going with the flow of things. I thought everything was going to be okay. Uh, luckily, I'm 32. We still have plenty of good years ahead of us. Right. We've got all these surgeries taken care of, right. and all we have to do is maintain. And uh, a big problem for the Pacquiao fight was weight management. Mm -hmm. One, for the first time in my career, because Wink always warned me. He always warned me. He said, "He said you just wait, pimp." So he used to tease me. So now <laughs> listen. So when I used to fight, tease you about what? Gain weight. Uh -oh. So I would, I would, I would fight and gain weight. I blow up. Da da da. So then when I come back to the gym, him and the rest of them, they used to tease me about. You know what I'm saying, man? Why you gain so much weight when you when you after you fight? You know you're gonna be fighting again. Why you gain so much weight? I say. Just wait till you start making money, and we're going to see how, 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 how you do it. And that's what happened. He started making – dog, this dude can eat. This dude – and he eat crazy stuff. See, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm going to eat the same thing. Like all, what? What's crazy Everything. Stuff? This boy eat everything. He tastes – He don't eat nothing. This so dude crazy. Me. This dude be eating raw stuff. He eat – this dude crazy, man. I be like, dog, you going to eat that for real? He just – man, you got to taste it. You got to let your taste bud. I'm like, man, you out your mind. This dude will eat anything. I'm, I'm a foodie, you. man. You know, uh -uh. like I said, I didn't just I didn't just keep going to Tokyo just to see my wife. You know what I mean? Right. Right. I was eating that wagyu steak. We was throwing down. You know what I mean? Raw all that stuff. all that sushi they got see? over there. You know, I mean, we was. <laughs> I mean. I mean, Tokyo has the most Michelin star restaurants in the world. You know, they, they beat France by one star. So, I mean, it's I just got to go to some amazing French dining. You know, like he says, man, when you make when you make the money, you can eat it's, better. it's different. You can eat better. But besides eating better, the big paychecks, you're only going to see roughly two a year. You know, and that gives you a bigger time off. Mm. And that's what it really does. It's that time off allows us to indulge more. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you and see it because because boxing, yes. boxing, we're, we're not LeBron James. Yeah. We're, we're not these NFL guys. We're, we're not owned by teams. You know, we're very individual. You know, yeah. that's why you got that's world right. champions that are al al alcoholics and stuff. Yeah. You got yeah. throughout history. You, right. know, you got you got so many different things. And it's hard to tell the fighter what to do when at the highest level of our industry, the fighter is the captain the fighter right. is the boss what's going you on. know we're going to talk about that because you are you are you are but it the allows boss. it's 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 one of those things like like how it is here in america we talk about freedom 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 but sometimes all freedom allows you to do is more dumb shit <laughs> all freedom really allows you to do is make more mistakes right. instead of um being uh, more disciplined and more diligent uh, about the approach on 
on what just there's just yeah. better ways of going about things when you when you open up the door and you have all this freedom oh i'm not gonna i'm only gonna fight six months from now so for three months i can get in shape in 90 days yeah. no that's plenty of time you know so why not for the other 90 days be on vacation i used to i used to have a motto when i was champion i say i work so hard so i don't have to work so hard you know and that's what camp was to me but I'm starting to see the benefits of staying in shape, of staying in shape taking right. care of your body like a LeBron James. The reason why these athletes who are on season have a regiment off season, but boxing is one of those ones where we really need to step up into that zone. Yeah. We need, but the problem is it, it's on the team of the athlete and the athlete himself. How well does he listen to his team? Mm -hmm, does he mm -hmm. allow himself to listen or is he a dictator? Mm -hmm. You know, and even though a lot of us are dictators, we still at this point in sports, athletic science and everything that we're learning now, mm -hmm. boxing and UFC, all these fights, if they want to have better careers, they're going to have to maintain their body right. on season, off season. And now that I'm finally in the new decade, I'm 32. That's right. Just, just, you know, we're just tick tocking our way up that ladder, but it's in this stage in your thirties. That's where an athlete really gets tested. So if I want to push back, past 34 35 and 36 i'm gonna have to maintain my health and my wellness today not tomorrow you're listening to welterweight champion keith thurman that's hall of fame boxer winky Wright. this is ktfo which means knock the fuck out we'll be right back in a second winky Wright presents ktfo boxing's go talk Here's one of the GOAT stars right now. And we're back. Welcome to KTFO Boxing. What stands for you? Knock the fuck out. And I'm letting the GOATs talk. That is welterweight champion Keith Thurman and also Hall of Fame boxer Winky Wright. Now, boxing move. Did, did you watch Creed, Keith? You like the Creed and Rockies? And I, did, I did like Creed. I didn't see Creed 2. Um, but what I liked about Creed was that they used um, some real boxers. You know, they they did their due, due diligence. Um, I don't know if it's just me because it has a lot to do with me, but I felt like they did research about me because, uh -oh. <laughs> you know, there's some very, some that I do when I get into the ring, especially ever since my um, TV, my, my major TV appearance, my first fight on uh, HBO. Right. Go look at Keith Thurman fights. You're only going to see the same thing over and over. Keith Thurman walks into the ring wearing red, white, and blue. That's right. Why? Mm -hmm. Not just because I'm an American fighter, okay. but because being in that ring is my all-American dream, right? I like that. And so, and boxing is is a very um, prideful sport because mm -hmm. we are world champions. Mm -hmm. People, you know, you might have to fight somebody um, from Africa. You might have mm -hmm. to fight somebody from Europe. You have to fight, you know, the Japanese and this and that. And that we all know about the Mexicans and the yeah. Puerto Ricans and the Dominicans. <laughs> and I fought an Argentinian yeah. and that boy was tough, yeah. you know? And, and so there's, there's that pride and I, and I love representing that, but I was so close to being an Olympian back in 08 for the China games. And so I've always just wanted to represent america so i just found it very interesting that i was a world champion at the time and you know they did a lot of research and then creed came in with that red white and blue american flag you know young brother strong this and that and just you know i, I just like that color scheme and i just always wondered with the directors if my uh, attire had any role into them Didn't picking it. that you know what i mean it, it was just interesting i'm gonna jump back to that but I, and you know this is it's, it's all positive but i want to ask you this because you you clearly are very patriotic and all american right mm -hmm. but we're in a country where some people have said that america doesn't treat us right being minorities and people of color like is that been a challenge for you or do you just look past that and just say look i'm just keith thurman I'm focusing on me. Like, tell me the balance of that. I mean, when they got a word for being one eighth black, you you got to understand what country you're in. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Right. They have a word for being one eighth black. You know what I'm saying? That means that, you know, it's that old mentality. You know that that king and the queen and the in the in the pure blood, and racism 
runs deep. It runs before I was ever born. It runs before you were ever born. It's you know, here. it's when you leave. Yes, you it's it runs leave. deep. I believe though it is a mindset. It's a conditioning, right? Um, Little Wayne talks about this very, very big because it was a white officer that picked him off the floor when all the other cops were stepping over him. And he had bullet wounds in him and nobody wanted to call mm -hmm. the ambulance. And the white cop took him to the hospital. <clears throat> you know what I mean? He picked so him up and carried him when he shot yeah, himself. Yeah. yeah, You know, you there's there's just stories, you know. You can't always just make it about race, but. In understanding the history of minorities here in America, of course, me being part black, I look into black history, right? But if you look in California and the history of when the Chinese first came over here, right? And, you know, there weren't um, restrictions on drugs, you know, a hundred years ago. There wasn't, they were selling them in magazines. Mm -hmm. You can get opium on, on your doorstep, mm. this and that. Right. You can get it delivered to you. You can get heroin delivered to you, cocaine delivered to you. There was cocaine and Coca-Cola. Everybody knows this old history, Absolutely. right? But the Chinese and the Chinese parlors, what they were doing with their women and they were having that dude smoke the that little bit of opium mm -hmm. and get all the feel good and get a little freaky on and then he'd be <laughs> put to sleep and then he'd wake up and his Rolex is missing. He waking up and his time piece from his great grandfather is missing you know and they were getting enough you know complaints right mm -hmm. but obviously the asian is stealing from you know don't want to go on race here but they're stealing from the white man right like they were talking about recently i was listening to people talk about the crack epidemic right they're talking about the crack epidemic and how nobody cared about the crack epidemic but now there's all these major lawsuits i know a lawyer who's active in it right now who's fighting for the opioid epidemic because the opioid destroyed families the opioids destroyed households but the opioids were in the white neighborhoods in the majority yep where the crack was not in white neighborhoods but now they understand that an opioid addicted person is not a criminal. They're a victim. A crackhead is not a criminal. They're a victim, you know, but it takes it. It, it, it took it took it happening to them to have sympathy and to have a, and, and to have yeah. a better understanding of what's really happening. And it really I believe this is what knowledge is power and why education is so important, you know, Instead of just saying, oh, look at that, that bum, look at this, look at that. You don't, you don't, don't know, know what he went That's through. That's right. You don't that know bum. where Do they, they still were use at. that in Boston? Do they still call people bums? No, we talking about that bum on the street. He just okay, talking about I'm some talk, personal. I'm talking about yeah. just people gotcha. in, general. Yeah, in general. All right. Yeah. Just wanted you to know, make sure. Keep going. I'm sorry. You know, everybody, everybody, you know, people say that word notoriously around. Correct. You know, period. Right. You know, um, I believe that we're just in a time to where we understand the human being too well, right? We understand us too well. And um, one, of, one of my favorite things, I'm not a Buddhist, but what I love about Buddhism is he says so many things that is just real, which is life is suffering. From the moment you're born, a baby is crying. They can't communicate. You don't know if they're hungry. You don't know if they got congestion. They're suffering, and they can't even express it besides crying, right? Mm -hmm. Um at the end of the day, everybody wants happiness, mm. you know, it's all that they seek. When they wake up in the morning, they uh, want a good day. Yeah, Does anybody wake happens. up in the morning and, want, and wishes for pain. a bad day? People <laughs> no. want right. a good day. <laughs> you right. stupid. That's, <laughs> that's, what, that's, that's what they want. They want to go on the golf course and they want to have a good day. That's that's right. Right. They know they're not always yes, going to get it, yeah. but they go out there hoping that that's what they achieve, you know? Right. I mean, Race is 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 one topic. They're making sex more important than race, which yeah. is just you know, which, which that's a whole nother. Yeah, like, we, we ain't gonna, gonna get political. We gonna keep we gonna keep this we gonna keep this on boxing. Yeah, yeah we yeah. gonna keep this on boxing. You definitely are he very hit the much point, into though. the he hit a good point. Yeah, yeah. 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 like a Bruce Lee fan. Growing that's up? that's what got oh, me into boxing. I'm a Bruce Lee fan, man. Big time. Everybody was kung fu fighting. Yeah, you know. So, um. I actually didn't get to tell you. Uh-oh. I didn't get to tell you. Kung Fu is what got me into boxing. Really? Right? So my father, he did martial arts, and I was about four years old, and I used to, like, almost shadow his, like, katas uh -oh. and some of his motions. And, like, wink, I, I had the desire to do something combative, right? Mm -hmm. But, 
life didn't present itself. I mean, I was, I was only four years old. I'm, I'm just, you can I just remember back play. to when you were four. Luckily for me, uh, the something about going to preschool mm. and Uh-oh. for the first time really having preschool teachers. That's cognitive thoughts. Now you going something, like, some, something, something, my memories don't go before four years old, right. but I can remember the playground at four years old. I can remember a few things that we did and a few things that I did and how everybody had to go to nap time and I would fake sleep during it. Cause <laughs> everybody I, did that. A, I ain't yeah. trying to take a nap. I'm, I'm four. I'm not two. Amped I'm not, up. not trying to take a nap. Yeah. yeah. I don't, I want to keep playing, you know, but I, so I do have memory from that early on, but nothing beyond that. But another thing that helps me keep that memory was my love for Kung Fu. My, I lived with my mother. My mother was a single mother, but when I spent time with my father, we would watch Bruce Lee, Jack mm-hmm. and Chan. And then the only uh, white boy that mattered, Steven Seagal. You know what I'm saying? Oh, back I mean, then, John, with Jim John Kelly. Van, I mean, not Jim Kelly, but uh, John Carl Van Dam was bad too. No, no, no. What's the what's the white? It is Jim uh, Kelly. No, no, no. no. Jim the, Kelly with, with the side, with yeah, 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 with the sideburns. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. was that Enter the Enter the Dragon? Yep. Yeah. Uh, what's his We'll name? come back to yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. but you know, I hit you with this so one. You remember the Five Deadly Venoms? Mm, barely, see, not barely, barely. I love Kung Fu. I never barely. really remember the names of them, but when they be having a long hair, be in the desert, and they be talking, and then. Yeah. And then that thing, you know, they jump on the mountain. They be fighting, <laughs> and then they yeah, jump, and then they jump on the mountain. <laughs> silly. Hey, all right, I, I, I want to switch subjects real quick because this is this is also important. Now, Wink, do you do you remember the first time you got hurt in boxing? Yeah, hell yeah. Who, who, when when did you get hurt? What did you? Hurt? Uh, the, the first time I really got hurt was when the dude hit me with a body shot. I don't know where where it was. I didn't go down. I did what he did. He hit me with a body shot, but I I had to let him, I had to keep moving so he making it didn't hurt me. I had mm-hmm. to show like it didn't hurt me, but in reality I was like, God damn, that shit hurt. So when he hit me with it, I kept moving, but I'm saying to myself, if you hit me one more time, but I got to go down, but now I can't go down. So <laughs> you know, I, you know, so I had to fake like I'm just pump, pump, pump. So I go to the corner, I tell Dan, I say, God damn, he hit me in my he hit me with a a right hand right like right on my floating rib. This it kind of like knocked the air out of me at the same time. But my pride wouldn't let me go down. So then the next round, I tried to kill him. And you know what I'm saying? I got him out there the following round after that. So it was, I remember that, that that probably was the hardest punch I ever got hit with. Even when I ever got knocked down, I never felt hurt. It was just that they caught me at a good shot, but I never felt hurt. But that was the only punch that hurt me. You know what I'm saying? I is, was like, is yes, pride man. a motivator? Hell yeah. You know, for me, it's, you know, I want to. For me, okay, I grew up with my grandparents. My grandmother raised me. So my thing was in boxing was to always do good for my grandma. Always show mm. out for my grandma. Right. Always and, and and to me it was like, you know, I'm gonna show my grandmother that she, her grandbaby is gonna do it. And no matter what people say, ain't gonna do it. Cause my grandma used to always be like, Baby, you sure you wanna do this? Baby, that guy look tough, baby. I say, Mom. Cause I call her mom, cause even though she raised me. So I call her mom, I say, Mom, I say, he look good cause he ain't fought me. <laughs> That's what I used to tell all of them. They say, "How you think you gonna beat the pride?" They haven't fought me yet. How they feel? They gonna beat me? Where that confidence come from, though? Just all, oh, just want to be the best. I just want to be but the that best. Don't, you don't just see. This is the thing. This is where we talking that goat talk, and I'm ha- I'm gonna come back to you too with that same. He question, was unique, Keith. man. I want to tell you something about Uh-oh. Wink, man, and, and something that really, <clears throat> you know, he just knew that he could do what he could do to you and to you. And to people couldn't stop Wink. Mm-hmm. Wink was too good with it. He was too accurate. I mean, it really was one of the best jabs we'll probably ever see. He was too accurate. He was too poised for somebody. One of the most impressive things about Wink, because like he said, every oh he's good. He ain't fought me yet. Mm-hmm. How does I know where my confidence came from? I knew that I could put you to sleep, sleep. You know what I mean? Here's a fighter whose intention isn't to knock you out. Yet he'll let you try to knock him out because he knows he can block your punch, see your punch, counter, counter your punch, punch <laughs> you know, hit you before yep. you punch, you know, and is he's the one who really taught me that there's a vision in boxing, that your eyes might be the greatest weapon mm-hmm. before your hands. And control. You have to control the fight, right? But he didn't he didn't use excessive movement. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Right. Even though he's talking about Sugar Ray Leonard, yeah. he didn't use he he didn't circle the ring. Right. He wasn't on his in toes. Control, control he's, the fight. Make the fight controlled, come to you. He controlled it in a whole nother way. He can put pressure. Uh, he can put pressure on you with a jab. No other fighter really puts pressure on you with a jab. Right. It was he could press you and keep walking into you. You're stronger than him, mm -hmm. yet you can't get him to leave you alone. Right. I mean, there was just something that something about uh, somebody who knows that they're not the strongest guy mm -hmm. in the room, mm -hmm. yet he knows he can take the strongest guy in the room. Right. I had a feeling that that's where a lot of his confidence yeah. was underlying. I, I, like he said, I sparred a lot of big guys. I, you know, in, in my whole career, I was always the smallest person. I would train with bigger guys. But my thing was, like he said, my mindset was, okay, I know you got a big right hand. I know you got a big punch. But can you fight inside? Can you move your head? Can you block these body shots? So I would take your offense and, and use my defense to make you think about your defense. So once I take away whatever you got, if you got quick hands, just once I take that away, now you thinking like, okay, what I'm gonna do now? But now I'm on a, I'm on the upcome because now I, I I didn't took away one of your weapons. Now what you gonna do now? Now you think, okay, well. I, can I can I hit him? I can't hit him. Now what I'm gonna do? How do you decide that? Is that from studying and watching? Yeah, when tape? I see a fight, when I see fighters back, when I was hungry for the game, I would see what a fighter would do. I say, okay, he got quick hands, he got a good power shot, but he leave his hands that he don't block his body shots, or you know what I'm saying? He like to move around it this way, so I'm gonna make him go the other way. So once I do something to knock you off your balance of what you normally used to doing, where where you feel comfortable at, now you're not comfortable, you uncomfortable. Now you're gonna make mistakes, and when you make mistakes, I gotta be right there to. To capitalize. If you notice, whenever I fight, sometimes I let people throw four or five punches, but I'm blocking the shot, but I'm watching. Okay, as he throw that fifth punch, what is he doing? Is he still standing right there? So then that's when I start counting, and that's when I start going to the body. That's when I jab you when you're backing out. That's when I keep that pressure on. You're getting tired now. He he throwing all these big shots. Now he's getting tired of breathing. And that's when I used to kill him with that little inside body shot. And man, look at it. it, it was just, so you look for, like poker, do you look for tells like yeah, that? Oh, yeah, you definitely, yeah. Like say, you can tell when somebody's gonna do something. If you know they're gonna look up with the right hand, you know they're going, they're getting tired or you know they need to move. So I just take my time and say, okay, well, I gotta set them up. I gotta set them up. And it's about setting. Boxing ain't about boxing ain't fighting. People think boxing is fighting. Fighting is when you fight off instant. You just react. Right. Boxing is you gonna react, but you thinking and it's, it's a game plan. You gotta go oh, in here with a game plan. Strategic. You gotta go in there with a game plan. Make somebody fight the fight you wanna fight. And and when you in shape and when you put in all the work to do what you had to do to get to that point, you can do that. But if you cheat yourself, like you said, you can't cheat yourself. You know you know, if you in the gym and you ain't did all the sit-ups you need to do, you ain't do all the running you need to do, you ain't do it, you know in that you saying to yourself, I can't, I, I don't, don't want to go 12 rounds or I don't want to go 10 rounds because I know I ain't in condition for that. You know what I'm saying? I know I ain't do all the sit-ups, so I can't let them hit me in the body. So all these things you know about. All right, so we're going to go back to this now because all the things that we know about, and you, you alluded to this earlier, you were talking about vision. So, mm -hmm. Mr. Thurman, if you could, when you're in that locker room, and you're putting yourself in the zone. Do you, well, I'll let you explain it, but do you have the vision of execution before you get into the ring or when you step into the ring? Walk me through the, ch the tunnel vision of the fight when you're back there and they're getting ready to call your name when you step out into that arena. Well, Wink was already kind of talking about it a little bit. So right before you are about to be in that arena. Like he was just saying, your training camp is what was the most important. Mm -hmm. So you're backstage in that arena. Mm -hmm. How much confidence do you have depends on how hard you trained. Mm -hmm. You know, if I know I ran seven miles five days a week, that's 35 miles a week. If I know I put in my work, mm -hmm. I'm ready. Mm -hmm. I know that I was on that heavy bag and I was hitting that heavy bag. Bop, 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 <laughs> bop, bop, bop. But guess what? In a few minutes, there ain't no heavy bag. That's There's right. an opponent. And he's gonna have to take them shots, mm -hmm. right? And so, and and I and I tell fight fans this too. Whenever you see a fight, you're watching the outcome of the preparation. Correct. Nobody can perform without the preparation for the performance. So when they're like, dang, man, why that fighter look like that this time? Why he look like this and that? Man, he don't got it no more. Mm -hmm. Maybe sometimes we've seen people, they hit a stage, they don't got it no mm -hmm. more. But 
that might not always be the case. Maybe he did not prepare for this fight properly. Mm -hmm. He underestimated his opponent, X, Y, and Z. He took a little bit of time off, mm -hmm. right? Maybe they was hanging out at the club just a little too much, celebrating before the fight's over type thing, right? Does that happen? Oh, oh yeah. you know, yeah, you know, like I said, man, we we the boss. It's hard, <laughs> you know, it's hard to it's yeah, hard to yeah, hey, yeah, hey champ, yeah, yeah. hey, especially when you're talking to champion. Yeah. Hey champ, <laughs> champ, go to bed, champ. Go to bed. <laughs> Come on, champ. He gonna look at me. <laughs> Wow. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, hey, just yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, been, it's been a lot of us. You right, know? You gonna look right. at me. You saw that shit, man. Hey, go to bed, champ. Go to bed. Yeah. What is this? Especially what is this? if you in Vegas, you know what I'm saying, and you like to gamble, you know, it might be time to go to bed, and you just like, you know what, I'm just play a little bit more. They're like, come on, champ, go to bed. You know what I mean? They rest up. You know, we got to get ready for this fight, different right. stuff like that. You the boss, though, so, yeah. and, and self-contained, so... Outside of the trainer, like who who who's telling you what to do? Who's it's basically the trainer, but your homeboy is telling you, look, man, come on, man, we because they, you know, your team is part of you. Your team, you represent your team, and your team represents you. So if you if you out here hanging out in the club, you doing all this stuff, that make your team look bad because they saying, man, you know, your man don't need to be out here. So why why you don't tell him? You know what I'm saying? Like A you said, we the boss. They, we pick bad teams. We're talking some, in all sports. Some, yeah, but because we liked it, we liked it. Like you said, we like to be the boss. We don't want nobody telling us what we need to hear but you gotta have some of them people in your corner to tell you what you need to hear so that you can understand that you are not undefeatable you're not unbeatable yeah, but if right. you train and do what you can do you can win but if you don't that's when you need to yep. yeah. yeah you know so before certain fights you know depending on the fight in that training camp i might have saw certain things by watching film and I might've already created, um, scenarios in my head, you know, uh, when, before I was a world champion, when I was an interim champion, I fought an undefeated fighter, Diego Chavez. He was 22 and 0 with, uh, 18 knockouts and I was 20 and 0 with 18 knockouts. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this is just two punch puncher versus puncher. This was a big fight. Pound this was one of my HBO fights. Yep. And I thought to myself, look, he doesn't go the distance well. I saw him get dropped by a mid-tier fighter in like the 10th round, you know, from an uppercut. And I said, you know, if this goes in the deep waters, I'm going to get this kid. But I had the pride. I wanted to show that I can get him out early. early. You so know? you go in there with that thought process. Well, I did with the, with the way that fight was and where I was at in my career. And I just wanted to really make a statement. Um, <clears throat> and I remember pre-fight, post conf uh uh, press conference before the fight I told the fans I'm getting them out in four rounds if I don't get them out in four rounds come see me after the fight and you can get your money back you know what I mean <laughs> and where does that <laughs> come from what, who said that why, where, why would you say that is that because, just to sell tickets no that's because just you gotta listen, you gotta listen is to it the, real because you, you gotta listen like to it. the fine print come see me after the fight yeah. you gotta see me after the fight how you're many fights how many people see me after the fight let's be real let's be real let's be real Wow. Got him. <laughs> Got him. No, listen. So there was a person who came up to me at my hotel after the fight and said, Thurman, you got him out in the 10th. You didn't get him out in the fourth. I said, I said, you want your money back? How much was your ticket? And it was like, nah, that was a great fight. That great was a great fight. fight. Yeah. You know, and, and, and so, yeah, the, the fans didn't even test me on that one, but I had a certain game plan that I really wanted to execute, but he proved to me that they breed them tough in Argentina, boy. They breed them tough. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Dominicans and too. his mm -hmm. and and that record of his, I, I thought it was a padded little record. It, wasn't, it wasn't as padded as yeah. I thought it, it was. It was real. It was kind of real. Yeah. You know, and for the first four rounds, he might have, you know, because he was actually the interim champion. I was competing for it. Mm -hmm. So I, the, the judges were all over the place for those first four rounds. But I knew that I might not be winning. And at good case, it's a draw two to mm -hmm. two. So I said, look, it's done. He already punched me in my nose and made it bleed. It, it, it bled for the rest of the fight uh, in those first four rounds. And then at the end of the fourth round, he hit me on with a jab on the tip of my nose. Mm -hmm. And I said, that hurt. I said, this stupid jab just hurt my nose. <laughs> I said, he's not allowed to hit me no more. He was bobbing, making me miss my hooks. He wasn't a mm -hmm. good slipper. He just ducked. Yeah. He just had a little bobbing for apples. He just bobbing for apples and made me miss. And I said, look, he can slip punches. He ain't the only one. Round five, 
I said, I'm going to show them how I can box. Because mm-hmm. we're already in round five. I didn't knock them out like yeah. I told the fans I was going right. to do. Yep. Right? So now I had to make more of a strategy. And I started showing him my boxing skill. And I slowed down my pace. The moment I slowed down my pace, he slowed down his pace, which helped me understand I'm controlling the fight. Because if I slow down my pace, but you want to get me, mm-hmm. you're going to get on top of me. Mm-hmm. You're not going to let me slow down, slow down. Mm-hmm. and you're going to keep the pressure. But when I was when I was dogging him, he was dogging me. And then once when I slow down, he, he slowed down. down. And that means I'm the conductor. Right. And once when I realized and then he didn't even understand because the pace slowed down, I started moving. I started getting into better positions. I started picking my shots a little bit more round by round. I'm starting to win more. I'm starting to take over the fight. Yeah. And then just like I saw in the film, he didn't have those late rounds in him. I already saw him breathing heavy. They said, seconds up. That's 10 seconds to stand up. Yep. He was still sitting down. Mm. And I was like, is that some Argentinian thing? Right. I was like, <laughs> right. I was like, I was like, I was like, I was like let, yeah. me, let me not just say he's tired right away. Mm-hmm. Then he did it the next round. And I kept looking at him. You know how it is yeah, in the yeah. ring. Sometimes we really look, look across. Uh-huh, and I'm and really looking at him. And I see, I said, nah, Keith, he he's fading on you. And I said, I want to land a body shot. That's all I need. And I didn't get it that round. I got it the following round, a beautiful, uh, Boom. left, left hook, uppercut right into the solar plex, put him down, made Oscar De La Hoya stand up. Everybody was in awe. You know, th- 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 a lot of people were in, in shock. He got out of that round, but he didn't make it 30 seconds past the next round. But so <laughs> much going into that fight was from the locker room, everything, I knew exactly what I wanted to do and I and and I did it. That was the first time in my career I had a plan A and a plan B and I had to execute both Executed, of them. Executed, yeah. And I had to execute both of plan, them. Plan, organize, and execute. Yep. And that's when Paulie Milanaji stopped saying bad things about Keith Thurman mm-hmm. because he saw something. He was a commentator for that fight. He saw something real. Paulie Milanaji was a current champion in the Walter Waite division and that was his mandatory was this no name fighter from Argentina with all these knockouts. Mm-hmm. Paulie didn't want nothing of that kid. When he saw how I handled that kid, how how I fought him toe to toe, and then I made my adjustments, he said, "Man, Thurman's a little bit more than just a puncher because he saw that I was a thinker and I was really able to make adjustments." And you know that's that's what takes it to the next level. But got to um, be able to think in there. Got to be able to think in that ring. Wink, what was your what was your toughest fight? I like and regardless of what the fans and credit you personally, what was your toughest like fight? Like I said, I can't really say the toughest fight. You know, I had fights that were tough before I was known, you know, overseas or whatever. It you know, it was more of the obstacle that I had to overcome inside the fight. I'm gonna say Bernard fight was a tough fight just only because he kept holding me and he headbutted me. You know, people don't really understand. I could have I could have stopped that fight in the second, third round and just got a draw. And when it, nothing would happen, you know what I'm saying? Cause that cut on my eye, people stopped the fights for way smaller fights. But I wanted to fight Bernard. I wanted to beat Bernard. I wanted, you know, cause I knew he couldn't beat me. I was like, this guy, he just keep holding I'm I'm gonna get I'm gonna get to him. But, you know, over the time, I was bothering me, but I couldn't get off the way I want. But, you know, I still think I beat him, but I just, it wasn't the fight that I wanted. I wanted to use my jab more. I wanted to go to his body more. But he got them little tricky things that he do. He hold you. He hit you behind the head. He hit you. You know, it's just all these little crap things. He come in with his head. So now you got to watch out for his head and his hands. Mm. So it's like three, he got three arms. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> <laughs> it's stuff like that. But like I said, uh, you know, it's, it is what it is. We all going to have them tough fights, and, and but I love them. I love the challenge. People could say, I moved up. I had to go up to like 170, 175 to fight, but no, I'm 154 pounder. Went up, went up to yeah. 160. I didn't have to fight. He just fought. It wasn't like he was old and wasn't fighting. He just beat uh, Tarver. Right. You know what I'm saying? Tarver knocked out Roy Jones. So he, Tarver was the man. And he beat Tarver. So then he came and fought me. So I, I showed people that I want to fight the best. Give me the best and I'll fight the best. I don't care who it is, what they do, let's fight. Yep, I got you, I got you. So now, same thing to you, Keith. Now, you know, we know, and I want to talk about dirty fighters, but we're not going to name names, but what was your toughest fight that you recall where it was like, like, oh, like, barely got that, barely got through that one. That one was tough. Well, I'd say, you know, it was a little tough getting through the Sean Porter fight. Mm -hmm. And... 
That was I remember that was, fight. There was, there was, there was some there. boy that was a dog fight. I might not have ran a few miles for that. <laughs> <laughs> Say I, so, you know. I happened to buy a I'm treadmill. Clean. I bought yeah. a treadmill and I told Coach, you don't have to come see me at the YMCA. Uh-oh. I'll do my road work by myself, you know. Sometimes you know, good thing, yeah. in the ring by myself, road work by myself. <laughs> Never did it. So, <laughs> we, we, luckily for me, I knew I was going to be in a tough fight. So, I had these weights, like these three pound weights, mm-hmm. and I was in the back. I was in my backyard, and I, some just told me, like, boy, you ain't running, boy, but you need a shadow box. And I was some made Every me day. shadow box, yeah. you know what I mean? And I was shadow boxing, even though I wasn't running. And I had a lot of confidence going into the Porter fight because my first ever HBO fight, when I was scheduled to fight Marcos Maidana, mm. I knew Porter might be a champion one day. I knew we might need to fight each other, but I just knew we weren't going to rush into it. Mm. So I made phone calls and said, hey, can Porter be a part of this training camp? Mm. They were actively in a camp and they weren't satisfied. They took the phone call. They said, oh, yeah, we'd love to go down the to Florida and work with Thurman because we know that's good work. Mm. And and we sparred uh, back in the day as amateurs mm. because Sean Porter was playing football. Like you were talking about being a kid mm. playing multiple things. So he was playing football. His dad didn't want him to lose weight in boxing so he could be the position Big, he right. needed to be as mm. a football player. Right. So he sacrificed and never cut weight. He was fighting at 165 pounds as an amateur when he realized he ain't going to college, he ain't going to play football. Boxing's going to be his career. That's when he cut down because of his height. He would never, yeah, he would never would have yeah. done good at yeah. no 160 right, because yeah. of his height. He had to come down to 147. So we brought we brought him in, man. And and I and everything he did when we went to the track. I ran faster. When we were in the pool, I swam faster. So everything told me I'm a better athlete mm-hmm. than Sean Porter, right? And that I can beat this kid. So that that's where yeah. I didn't I didn't really underestimate him. I just think I had his number and it made me pull back a little bit. Mm-hmm. But I had a strategy and for the first time I did the rope a dope in the second round. I lay on the ropes and he's throwing punches at me and I don't ever talk trash in a fight. But something about Sean, I just he's like a buddy of mine mm. and I knew this was a big stage. I knew he wants to beat me really bad. He's not a champion. I'm a champion. He came to get the belt again and I'm on the ropes taking his punches and I say to him, "Come on, Sean, come on." And then he comes again. Boom, 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 boom. Right. And I said, come on, bring it, bring it. He goes, boom, 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 boom. I'm not going to get tired, though. I said, bring it. He goes, boom, 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 boom. I'm not going to get tired, though. And in my head, I'm like, prove it. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah. That's, right. head, I, that's what I didn't say out loud. Yeah. In my head, yeah, I'm, right. like, yeah. I'm like, this is round two, boy. Yeah, like, you, you know got a mean? long way to go. Yeah. I, I, I literally, I wanted him to use that energy mm. in round two. So he didn't have that energy in the championship wow, right. rounds, Round 10, right? 11, 12, baby. Now, the one judge, you know how judges be, mm-hmm. one judge scored the fight exactly how I saw the fight, which was round one, Thurman. Round two, Sean. I let him, mm-hmm. I let him work mm-hmm. way too much. Round two, Sean. Round three, round four, Thurman. Now, at this point, we, we have two halves of the fight to go, mm-hmm. and I have a two-point lead. So now... We can play. We we can play tug Tip and war. Tat. Mm-hmm. We can play tug yep. and war. Yep. It can go one round him, one round me, one round him, one round me, and, and I win, win the fight. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, and that was my overall strategy mm-hmm. leading up into the fight was to get a, a lead on him in the first, mm-hmm. and then just play with him and let let. Is you know, that get the entertainment part too, making sure your fans and everybody's entertained. No, that was me knowing I didn't do all my road work and oh. I needed to have a good I needed to have a good fight plan. I needed to have a good fight plan if I want to win this fight. Yeah. But the problem was it didn't go my way. And mm-hmm. this is what made it a tough fight. This is what made it one of the challenging fights in my career. Right. It didn't go my way. He started to really push it on and the way he was working and I was trying to counter mm-hmm. and I might have stole one of the rounds with a big punch in the last 15 seconds, yada, yada, but he was doing too much. And I knew at the end of the eighth round, I said, you can be blind. This is a draw. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And this was the most, this is the and most then. beautiful moment of my fight career. Cause all three judges they didn't score the fight the same way. After eight rounds, yeah. all of them had a draw. It was a unanimous draw yeah, at the eight. end of eight. Uh-huh. And I told myself, this is a draw. And I said, I'm in the corner. I'm tired. I'm breathing. Dan's giving me water. And I say to myself, I said, he can't beat you, champ. 
worst case scenario, it's a draw. And then I said, ain't nobody come here to see Brooklyn. No That's right. You know, ain't nobody come here to see a draw. No, sir. I said, do what you got to do. Dig deep. And let's take this victory home. And and I just <clears throat> I just maneuvered, man. I you know, I knew it was a close fight. It was close to a draw. He definitely never had the win in that fight. But I was able to manipulate and finesse the way he said, like the I gave Pacquiao his props. He did what he had to do. He kept his hands yeah. up. He didn't yeah. get hit by a lot of big stuff. He he still and then when he did get hit, he took it. Yeah. And and he was able to poker face through mm -hmm. and and he was able to finesse that victory mm -hmm. sometimes this happens in boxing where you do have to just finesse it yeah. and i feel like i did what i needed to do to finesse it against sean porter and you know if we ever were to do a rematch i would love to um work, train harder in training camp and do what i need to do to set ourselves apart because i'm happy that i got the victory but i've talked to um manny woods was in the gym mm -hmm. uh a day ago and he goes man you should have done way more work on porter you know he goes i think you could have done more work on danny too and that's something about myself i got away from my own mm -hmm. killer instinct mm -hmm. you know i don't know if it's just age um, um, the warriors used to talk about it that when 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 warriors get to a certain age, they want to go back to their family and they don't want to sacrifice and put themselves in that line of fire in the same way. Because when you really want to knock out, that's right. When you, you really want to knock out, you there's you have to step deeper into the danger zone. Mm -hmm. You got to go. You you have to have a willingness. Like Ben Getty always said, it takes balls to be in this sport. You know, you got to have a willingness to exert energy to finish him. But what if he's not finished? That's right. You know, power and it, management. And it's a yeah, it's it's a little bit of a roll of the dice. Sure. But when the job's done, we all get to go home early. <laughs> now, and, uh, you know, a lot of people still they wanted a Porter rematch. They wanted a Earl Spence rematch as well. Like, you know, not being able to make that happen, like. Do, do you feel, how do you feel about that? Like, do you feel like, ah, it is what it is or looking forward or is hindsight 2020? Well, sometimes you'll have a rematch, what I call it a career rematch, which means mm -hmm. the fight was so good against a certain fighter at a certain point of your career. At any other point of your career, you could always make that rematch happen. Right. Right. Where sometimes there's what's called an immediate rematch. You know, but we're seeing less and less of that nowadays mm -hmm. in the sport of boxing. We really are, yeah. you know, and uh, if you really want an immediate rematch, it has to be in writing. Otherwise, there's no guarantee that you will truly see it, you know, um, and part of me wishes I would have put the rematch clause in with the Pacquiao, you know, because mm -hmm. what's the I'm, rematch clause? Me. Re it's it's in writing. Right. It's a rematch clause. So you could do that. I was the champion. Of course. I was okay. the champion, gotcha. right? Mm -hmm. But I had confidence that I was going to be able to do what I needed to do. Plus, I also knew that what's the purpose of a rematch policy when right after this fight, I'm going to let a doctor cut my hand open and I don't know when I'm going to be right, back in the ring. The so I didn't, yeah. I didn't really want to play that whole political thing and I let that slide. But look, Pacquiao just fought not too long ago. I could have been ready to mm -hmm. step in the ring, Definitely. you know? So... Um, at the at the end of the day, that's that's just how it is sometimes. You know, if there would have been a rematch clause in the Porter contract, he would have got an immediate mm -hmm. rematch. There wasn't. I'm not obligated to. And after that, I had my, on eyes, big and I had my eyes set, yeah. set on big Danny Garcia, yeah. which is how we unified mm -hmm. the two world titles, which was really big at that moment because I think it was a 15-year time span. It's People have unified, but... This unification bout was two undefeated welterweights mm -hmm. in a unification bout, which is rare. When Errol I Spence was, just unified. Yeah, I think that was the first one was Ray Lennon and, and, and Tommy Hearns. What, uh, I mean, the last one before y'all. Was it Ray Lennon and Tommy Hearns? That's it's what I'm saying. It was like 15 yeah. years ago it's, or it's something. It was, it was a minute. That's, that's what made it really big right. and very important for me in my career at that time. I, I was very um, happy to, to make that fight happen. Okay. All right. KTFO Boxing, I'm letting the goats talk. That is Winky Wright and that is Mr. Keith Thurman. We'll be back in a minute. This is your favorite athlete's favorite athlete. KTFO Boxing. And we're back. KTF Bo Boxing, KTFO, where? Knock 
the fuck out. I'm letting the GOAT talk. That is, of course, Hall of Fame boxer Winky Wright and also welterweight champion Mr. Keith Thurman. Mr. Thurman, top five. You said Lil Wayne earlier. We were talking. If you go back, you can listen to it. You were talking about Lil Wayne. Who's your top five rappers, greatest rappers of all time? <sighs> yeah, take your so, time. Because they're going to scrutinize. They gonna, yeah. We're going to see how your yeah. music is, for real, for real. I mean, I've always, you know, you got to love Tupac and Biggie. There's you know, two. You gotta love them. Yep. You know. Um, oh, there's. You know, respect to J. Cole. Mm, I like uh, him. Green Lantern. Yeah. You know. Um, Greatest of all time, sir. Biggie, Tupac. <laughs> we need three more. Come on now. No I mean, easy. You know, Jay so gotta be in say, it. You gotta put Jay. About no, say, no personal you know, favorite one. I, <laughs> yeah, you know, cool. for me, for me, Jay was bumping, but he just he was a little bit before my time. And yeah. and what I admire, I love the Blueprint album. Yeah. I mean, I, I really love everybody. That the, album. All three of them. Yeah, I really, all loved, three. I really loved uh, those albums. But uh, Little Wayne, a milli, a milli, a milli, mm. a milli was played over <laughs> a million times. Yes, sir. You know what I mean? Yes, sir. And then you know, Weezy. I'm an alien. I'm a monster, man. Like. There was a time he was just so hot. It was yeah. so ridiculous. Um, so I, I almost personally want to put him on the list. Um, and then, and then this one might be someone put it that, out there that a lot of people don't know a lot about because he's actually overseas. One of them overseas rappers. Don't you say know. Jay Electronica. No, I don't okay. know nothing about no electric, electric <laughs> nothing. What? Like, I, I How you know doing? Oh, Jay, Glenn, you know? Jay, oh, what? You ain't no so keep them in rainbow. So I like, I like this dude known as Akala. Okay, uh. Akala. He's very different. He he did a fire in the booth. If you know anything about certain freestyles, so I'm a big, I'm a big, <laughs> nah, nah. Akala. He don't, he he don't. He the ain't greatest of no all look. time. Look, man. All right, look, it's. First off, the moment you ask a question of greatest of all time of anything, yeah. you're asking for another man's opinion. Yes, sir. You know what I mean? And we respect and so, it. Yep. The way that I look at rap, you have, I think Tupac is just the greatest of all times because of the poetic messages. Yeah. Right? And the storytelling. You identified right? with it. So we, I think everybody identifies with it. You know? I mean, I think that's what made it. N I, I think I think if a, if a if a white woman in the suburbs listens to Dear Mama, she can relate to it. True. You know what I'm saying? You don't and, have to justify it, a pot. Yeah. What you it don't is. Gotta justify you know, a pot. I, what a, what it but see, Akala, he was a little bit more like on that little bit J. Cole side where they speak about real things, you know, and mm -hmm. they rap about real things. Mm -hmm. So some people rap and, and get platinum albums and, and do all that, you know? And I think, uh, I think Biggie was hard to mess with his tongue. I think his tongue was the most fluent rapper of all times, yeah. but it's the, he lacked in the deliverance of the message to hit the heart and the soul like Pop, a Tupac, yeah. Pop you know, was deep. Parker, that's what All I'm right. saying. Yeah, you yeah. Know? So you you'll have to do some research and just see Akala. who this boy Akala Absolutely. is. Absolutely, we know gonna look. Oh, you trust me, we gonna boy look. Akala is. <laughs> you know, I mean, I he's just a personal. I he's even. just a personal favorite. Yeah. That's not wrong he with hasn't, that. He yeah. hasn't dropped a whole ton of things, but the stuff that he's he's done, and I'm definitely more of a fan of his freestyles. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And now because I have to talk about freestyles and freestyle rappers, I'm just gonna put Eminem on the list. Oh, you can't get mad at that. I'm gonna put Eminem on the list because I really love people who come from, like like Kendrick Lamar. Mm -hmm. I like people who come from freestyle backgrounds. Yes. Who battle rappers, battle, battle rapper and yeah. stuff. Yeah. Because sometimes, and and then this is the sad thing about some of these very talented individuals is that their freestyles outdo their songs. Some some rappers are freestylists where they can't make in the mm -hmm. recording, and that's so and that's, that's and that's my boy Akala. Okay. My boy Akala is more of a, a of a freestyle guy, somebody who's maybe done a few written things yeah. and ciphers and things of that nature. But his overall music is very eclectic. It's very different. It's not really for everyone's mm -hmm. uh, 
ears. You know, he's got a whole album called Shakespeare. I can, I don't Boy, even relate to that. Yeah, he, yeah, he, he, you, know know you got some money in there, King. Huh? Come on, stop it now. You got money in there. No, him. I'm just trying to let you know that I appreciate I pick, it. I pick strange things. So and I'm, I'm going to put in. I'm going to put in. I'm going to put in. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to put in my favorite boxer of all time. We're going to no, wait. Time huh? out. No, wait. We're going to come back to that. What's your top five rappers? Okay. Top five rappers. Oh, man. I knew you was going to. I got to. I, I got to go. Like I said, I'm I'm Tupac, Biggie. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Jay, uh, Nas. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I like Wayne because Wayne, Wayne your definitely. Fifth? The fifth is the hard one. Who's I know. The, that's what I'm saying. You got Wayne, Eminem. Got, yeah. That, uh, Who else? You know, I, I like old old rap back in the day, too. You know what I'm saying? So it just depends, man. I'm. I'm stuck. I'm stuck. I dead can't. Press. You got dead you, press. No, that's a good. I love dead press. Dead press. Dead, I, I take dead press over a collar now, but I yeah, do. I do. Dead dead press. Press. We, we need a body of work though. Dead press didn't have. They only had two good albums, and that's it. Like, but what? But we need to. But, but the they were yeah. the thing yeah. though. Yeah. yeah, love them. Yeah, fifth. I still. I ain't gonna let you off. I don't know, dog. You got a whole lot. You got. You I, no, I already said, said Jay. Jay. I already oh, said yeah. Jay. He said Jigga you know, Nas and Tupac and Biggie. Those are the. Yeah, yeah, okay. Them, we need yeah, 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 yeah. Eminem. Film. Okay, okay. Huh? Shit, I got L-L? one. Nah, nah. You know, even though I see all of them, but I, you know, I, I got to step up for face, nigga. Ah, Brad Jordan, <laughs> here we go. Brad Jordan, here we go. Brad Jordan, here we go. Brad Jordan, here you know, face, Shout I got, I forgot about, face, yeah, too. you know what I'm saying, you got to go, go face, man, yeah. I, you know, face a bad boy, you know what I'm saying, and them ghetto boys, and they, they did a thing, but face a bad motherfucker, man. Shouts out to Chris Jordan, too, that gave Brad that, uh, the kidney, so he can mm, stay definitely. on earth with it, you know, definitely. he had a kidney. Mm, definitely. All right, so, without, and I, I, we talked about this earlier, you can't, we know Ali is the GOAT, there's no greater, right? So, Ali's the GOAT. So, without mentioning Ali, who's your top five greatest boxers of all time? Well, Aaron the Hawk Pryor is my favorite of all oh, time. I love Aaron Pryor. Hawk was a beast. Boy. Lexus, so, if you earn Pryor, got to be in there. You got to put Lexus in there. Let him answer, bro. Oh. Stop. Come on. You know, I mean, I just loved it. And I thought it was uh, ironic that, um, you know, I watched this documentary on him and when he was jogging and, you know, he was in his hype mode, you know, these, what time is it? Hawk time. Yeah. What time is it? Hawk time. And then I ended up being one time, right. you know, so <laughs> right. I, I got to share something. Uh, yeah, you know what yeah, I mean, yeah, I got yeah, to share yeah. something what's with, your, what's with your my hero? favorite. Yeah, you yeah, know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, Sugar Ray Leonard. Of course, too. You know, um, for me, a lot of them, end up kind of being uh uh welterweight you know uh because they forget about the heavyweights huh it ain't, it's say. not it's it's mm-hmm. hard man you know I, I didn't enjoy watching them especially even what? growing up I, my pastor took me to a heavyweight fight and i fell asleep man they different <laughs> they slow wow um, slow just, they slow it's, it's the entertainment no you tyson know? um no definitely tyson you know to say. i mean tyson but tyson it wasn't because he was the best. It was because of how entertaining yeah. it was. It was because of the fights were ending too quick. It, like it motivated it me was, to knock people out like that. You know what I mean? Okay. That's okay. That that's why Tyson uh, will never be forgotten. Uh, but uh, I know that's I just, a tough, tough to answer, dog. Out of five, to pick five people out of all the boxing world is is tough. You know what I'm saying? You could pick five individuals just in the weight classes, but yeah, if you're making like, them go five at one like, time you know, is I tough. I just like to, to pick that. fighters that yeah. I like. Yeah, you know? yeah they, they, like, everybody like different day, fighters. Like, yeah. but you know, we like need, Julian but we, Jackson. No, you know, no, no, no. This is GOAT talk. We want you know. the greatest of all time. I got three. Give me two more. But not, so now you're asking me to pick GOATs, though. That's a different <laughs> thing. You know what I mean? Now you're asking me to just pick GOATs. I want you your favorite. He wants your favorite. Your favorite. Your favorite. His favorite. Your his favorite. favorite goats: Aaron Pryor, Mike Tyson, Sugar Ray Leonard. Two more. Mm-hmm. Two more. I said Julian Jackson. Julian Jackson. Julian one Jackson. More. One more. Uh, Wink you uh, up next. So the only I'm trying to think of mine now. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think. I got to think of mine now. The fifth one's always a tough one, and you know. I'm, I'm trying to think of which uh, which Spanish fighter to put up on the list. That's all. Man. Mm. Like, um, got a lot of good Spanish fighters, boy. And but then I might not at the same day, same time. <laughs> you know, because it's to I you, just, it's to whoever you think. It's man. your, it's your, it's personal, your personal, personal opinion, like you just told me. Yeah. 
And you know, I'll just, I'll just, greatest of all time. I'll just do you know because he he got he got beat by them tough boys, but still Pinnell Whitaker was just okay. something to watch. <laughs> okay, Sweet P. You know, now, yeah, there you R. go. R. Now, yeah. now I already said no. Okay, we're gonna go at my no, no particular order. No, no particular, particular order. order. Right. Now let's just get it. No particular order. These just fighters that I love. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I got a star. Greatest of all time, Sugar Ray Leonard. Yes, sir. One. Marvin Hagler. Marvelous. Got to put the Marvin Hagler. Yes, sir. Tyson. I put Holyfield in it because just the, the the ability Holyfield came from cruiserweight, heavyweight, man, under man, Holyfield was a beast. Then you know what I'm saying? Now that that, that last go. one. Here we go. It, it, it's so many people that I you can don't put care. right there. One. Just, just pick one. I'm just thinking, man. I like I like a lot of different fighters. You know, greatest put, of all I put time. Holyfield, Tyson, Ray Leonard, uh Marvin Hagler, and then you know. The greatest fighter for me of all time. Uh, you know, people would be like, why you didn't put Floyd in? Don't, don't get me wrong. I think Floyd was a great fighter skill-wise, you know, but I'm talking about for me for fighting-wise, just the fight excuses, that I want to see. No, I'm saying, you, you know, you're going to put Floyd you in You don't put this. Floyd in your top five. I, I definitely, I'm going to put Floyd in my top five, just cause I, not to say that he you don't deserve like it. No, 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 no. It ain't, it ain't that. It's Floyd, just, you wanna, see this, Floyd. No, you see I say this? Floyd, Floyd. Floyd definitely <laughs> a great fighter. That's big brother stuff now. No, you know, he was you know, him. know what it is? Is I think because he in my oh, era. Okay. I think because he's in my era, and I, I see him as another fighter and I don't really appreciate all the things that he's done in right. boxing yet because, you know, he's still in my era. But, you know, I will put Floyd in there, but I won a six. <laughs> uh, man, I'm, I'm thinking. Good side it. step, too, by the way. Nah, you know, I'm just being 100, man. I think Floyd, I he was Floyd, on my mind, too. Yeah, it's Floyd, just hard. Yeah, it's it's hard, just hard because, because he's in you're, your era. You're, you you're bringing up history. You're yeah. bringing up, you know. But this is the reason why y'all do this. So that's why yeah. I want those types of, like, who's, the, like, when you're coming up and you're watching. Sugar Ray Robinson, man. That, that's why Sugar I Ray go Robinson? That, that, okay, you went Sugar back to the. Man. Yeah, I got to go. Man, Ray Robinson was a bad right. boy. Listen, you man, you, you the champ. Don't I'm just talking about my, my, my issue. I'm talking about, you know, right. because it's before me. But right, like right. I said, Floyd definitely great fighter. KT, how many, how many trainers have you had? Two. Which is your favorite? Hmm? Oh well, well, I mean Ben Getty, man, the one yeah. who made me. Raised, yeah, you know, yeah. Ben Getty raised me from the age of seven to the age of twenty when he passed away. We got into St. Pete Boxing Club with Dan Birmingham when I was fifteen years old, and uh, you know, I got to spar Winky, Jeff Lacey, Antoine Eccles, Chad Dawson. I mean, yeah, yeah, matter of fact, Ben, through. Ben, and and Dan Birmingham, they they had a conversation and they said. Every sparring partner that's going to spar Winky and Jeff Lacey has to spar Keith Thurman first. Right. And they called it the Keith Thurman test. Yes. If you oh, could, if yes. you can get through me, then you were you're, worthy you're sparring yep. for them. Yep. You know, nice. and not everybody got through just so that you know. So, all right, Keith, let me ask you this then. Like, who do you like to watch now? Like, if you had to pick three fighters that are entertaining now, and I know you're in the sport now, so we won't go in your weight class, but who do you like watching now? I mean, right now, I mean, for – for several years, I mean, Lomachenko has been very exciting with what he does and his division and and his movement and his ring IQ. I know, I know, we lost, um, but at the end of the day, he was just somebody to truly watch. Canelo is still somebody to watch. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Everybody yeah. loves the, uh, his punch and power and. To watch a young fighter like Canelo to come from, you know, where he comes from with all his uh, Mexican history and then to start to adapt some of that slickness that Floyd showed him that there's a different type of caliber of boxing for him to integrate that and meld a little bit of that counter punching and a little bit of that head movement. I mean, it, it really elevated his game even more and made him even a bigger problem to deal with. Uh, he's been moving up in weight classes, you know, regardless of if there was something in the meat or not. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the, boy, the boy's been moving up in weight classes. He's just truly exciting. You know, I think Tyson Fury is exciting too, um, to a degree. Like I said, man, sometimes what do you weights, think about that last fight? Great fight. Uh, I did not tune in. Oh. Baby, the baby got me. Yeah, and I, I just, a great fight. I was, you know, 
Uh, but it sounded like it was just as exciting as the first rodeo. Uh, but he was able to close close out this time. You know, um, I know he's, he said he turned his life over to God. And I do believe he has an angel that keeps letting him get, get up. up after freaking. <laughs> you know, I mean, silly. not too many Boy, people. Yeah. Not too many people. <laughs> look, man, I've, I've hit somebody <laughs> once. And when I watched him get up, I said an angel did that. You know, give me a name. Who did you hit like that when you saw him walk up and you're like, damn, like, how did Give me this one. Charles comes. Hatley, man. There it was, you go. It was, a, it was yeah. an amateur fight, and uh, he got up and beat me on points. Stupid point system. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it is what it is, man. He, he, he was a tremendous amateur fighter. He didn't get to uh, um, prosper as a professional. He got beat by the Charlo brothers, I believe, coming up, uh, and a few other fighters when he was trying to make his name as a pro. Um, but, you know, that's boxing. I want to speed round with you. I'm just going to say some names and just give me a couple, like, real quickly, like, what comes to mind what you got to say about him, all right? Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Javante Davis. Exciting. He's actually one of the other uh, exciting people to watch right now. I definitely enjoy a good uh, Javante Davis fight. Teofimo uh, Lopez. Um, he's, he's making a name. Uh, Anthony Joshua. Mm, Joshua, question mark. Jermel Charlo. Uh, exciting. You like him? Yeah, I like I like the Charlo brothers. Okay, cool. Terrence Crawford? Terrence Crawford, for me. Solid. He's he's just very, very um, yeah, solid. He's what a switcher. He's good with both stances, you know, and a question mark on whether or not he's gonna dominate the welterweight division. Josh Taylor. Undecided. Mm. Errol Spence Jr. Errol Spence, you know, great fighter. Now he's gone through things similar to myself. Sure. How is he going to bounce back? Mm -hmm. Is he truly the truth? That's what I've always wanted. Mm -hmm. Is he truly the truth? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right. I'm a truth seeker. If you if yeah. you don't know that about me, I yes, seek sir. the truth. So I'm I'm looking forward to um, that fight. Hopefully, we can make that happen. So wrapping things up, you're still fighting. You're gonna jump back in the ring. We're looking to a positive 2022. Anything you know? Any any of that good pre boxing talk that you want to talk that talk about real quick before we get up out of here? Oh, well, you know, for me right now, it looks like we're just going to try to get back in the ring and come back. They're supposed to get a list of names from me. And when they got a list of names, that means that there's probably going to be a few fighters that I might not even have heard of. Mm -hmm. And I might have to do some research on. <laughs> but right now, we're just trying to get back in the action for myself, for the fans. And then once when your boy one time is back in action, and of course, I'm going to get judged on my performance, which I look forward to and then after presenting that performance i also look forward to going right back and having my eyes and my aim down the pipe looking at all the champions you know i want the winner of uh crawford and porter i want the winner of that uh, I would love an Ugas fight, and I would love a Spence fight. If Spence and Ugas fight, I want the winner of that. You know, so at the end of the day, after this comeback, all champions mm. right here. Come see your boy Keith One Time Thurman. <laughs> Mr. Thurman, you are again. You are on this podcast because you are you're definitely one of the greatest of all time. It's been a it's just been an honor and pl a pleasure speaking to you and talking to you and, and continued success to you for real because you you definitely are a good spirit and, and and I mean no one can say nothing bad about you. Your your legacy and your reputation precedes itself, and it's just been great watching you fight. And I, I look forward to some more. Anything you want to add on that, Wink? Oh, uh, just great seeing you grow up, man. Be Become the champion you are, dog. I, you know, I, I, I seen you as a little kid. I seen you progress. I seen your intensity get hard and strong. I seen your momentum, and you know, you carried yourself like a true champion. You know, and uh, hope you stay healthy and uh, get these fans what they want to see. Absolutely. And when the next knockout, just yell KTFO. KTFO, they got knocked man. the fuck out. <laughs> <laughs> that has been KTFO Boxing. That is Winky Wright, Hall of Fame Boxer, and again, unanimous, undisputed champion.
unanimous. I don't, it's undisputed. Don't, no, tell me then. It's, tell no, me. it's no unanimous. It's, it's just no unanimous. undisputed. It's just undisputed. You, there you go, my brother. Yes, undisputed, sir. which means you can't dispute it. You can't that, talk about it. You can't say there was this guy, there was that guy. There that, was only, only the man me, right here. Only one, Winky Wright, man. only one standing. <laughs> and, Last man and standing. And he's, he's part of the reason why I became champion. Because growing up with him, you know, I, I just want to thank you for all the things that you taught me without really teaching me. You taught me in the in, in the hard way. But me just being in the atmosphere with you at the highlight of your career really showed me what it takes to be a champion. And just some of the smaller, delicate things, how important the jab actually was, mm. how important it was to utilize your defense and how sometimes you not you don't have to be the strongest man, but you can still win a fight. Mm. I learned so many things from Winky Wright, and he never sat down and gave me any lessons. Uh -oh. But just being around him, I learned so much. I took so much from him. It. I took so much from from other fighters and champions, right. yeah. and even opponents. You know, sometimes you get a lesson, even if you want to fight. He might have hit you with something. You like, right. I don't want to get hit with that ever again. <laughs> you know. So thank you so much for having me on Appreciate the show. It, Ken. I'm I'm, I'm glad you enjoy my career in yeah. the same way that I've enjoyed watching your career. Thank back you, my brother. Keith Thurman, God bless you. God bless you, my man. Thank you, fellas. We out. <laughs> <laughs>